too scared of the music business. I'm too scared of all the people. Is that sad or what? That's what the show business people are like. They love to torture their entertainers. Those fuckers in show business. You know? They turn me into the psycho I've become. rock singer in the world. One of the best rock singers in the world. It's very easy, just go up and down. Come on, come on, let's merry go, merry go, merry go round. Boo, 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 merry he is a brilliant artist. There are things that Larry does that just can reduce me to tears. Oh, Linda, no Lori, oh, Linda, no Lori, oh, Linda, no Lori today. And oh, my conscience is bothering me. He's about as pure of a rock and roll icon as you could find. I think it would be harder to find anyone in rock and roll that is purer than Larry. I'm the meanie, I'm the meanie, I'm evil, wicked, and stingy. It's always been a dream of mine to record an album with Wild Man Fisher. He's a very exciting young man, a very extremely talented young man. I mean, to me, I still don't think he's a good singer. I might be wrong. Maybe the world will prove me wrong. Derailroad him. <laughs> oh, yeah, you got to do that for us, too. I've been derailroaded. I already did that. Want me to do it again? Yeah, right. do it again. Here we go. All right, here it goes. So let's, you want to do derailroad and then start walking. Be careful. I have been derailroaded. Derailroaded. You can like, do it like take you start the movie. All right. You're walking on the beach. All right, let's like go. This. I have been derailroaded, derailroaded by everybody. I have been sent off the track to wander like a fool. Oh, I have been derailroaded, derailroaded by everyone. They are liars and they are thieves and they left me to stand around like a derailroaded fool. Oh, I have been derailroaded, derailroaded by the pipers and the sneakers. They have Before he gets off the team, come on, he'll go right through the door. This is not my house, so don't say in the video, this is my house. Okay, no, I won't. This is my aunt's house. My aunt's sick. Josephine's sick, I'm gonna have to take care of Alice and the dog. Why she's sick. I know. All of a sudden, I'm in control of the house. I'm scared. Why are you scared? I've been very paranoid lately, all right? There's people after me. I don't know if you're involved. I don't know who's involved. I didn't say you were involved, but I just don't know who, who's involved. It's, it's been a nightmare. I think there's snipers around. There must be hundreds of them around. I think they listened to one of my conversations, and so they've been, people have been after me ever since. All kinds of things have happened to me. Things you would not believe. Uh, All I know is that my life is, nothing can have my life now. Somebody wants me and they're gonna, everywhere I go, even with David, they're there watching me. It's really weird, man, you wouldn't believe it. They're just 
torturing me. Whoever it is, they're torturing me. And it's not my imagination. But you know, I knew I would never be able to tour and stuff. I'm too paranoid. But now I'm quadruple paranoid. So now, what am I going to do now? You know? You're doing the right thing. Sit here and wait till somebody wastes me, right? It's unfortunate that Larry has not had more commercial success with his music. But Larry is a manic depressive, paranoid schizophrenic, and that is an interesting diagnosis. Huh? That's an interesting okay. mixture That's of, of uh, energy. A person with schizophrenia is characterized by delusions, hallucinations, usually auditory hallucinations. A lot of it has to do with a feeling of conspiracies being directed at you. Everyone's out to get you. Here goes the helicopters. What is this? Oh, no. Look at this. Apparently, they know you're here. Do you know me? You, you know what's going on. He, he's his own worst enemy and sabotages things that could really help his career. I think schizophrenia is part of what makes him who he is, but it limits him in many ways. I mean, look what happened with, with him and Frank Zappa. I thought that from the first day that I met him that somebody should make an album about Wildman Fisher. I've known him since 1965. When you're working with somebody like Wildman Fisher or people who are out there, the problems that arise after the album is completed uh, sometimes become too much to bear. I never thought that he would have a real career. And, you know, I see him now, and he looks like a very, very exhausted version of that person that I knew then. It's, he's almost identical. I would say I'm a normal, everyday person, you know. I like girls. I like to eat restaurants. I like sports cars. I like motorcycles. I like to get married one day, have kids, you know, raise a normal family, normal neighborhood, you know. My mother always just, you know, uh, wonder about me. She always wondered what I was going to do when I get older. I said, Mother, don't worry about me. Uh, I'll get a job. <laughs> I'll go straight. <laughs> Excuse me, I got to tie my shoe now. Are you rolling? Don't roll. Don't roll. You want to take a break? You got me thinking about the past, Frank. If Wild Man Fisher had been given emotional stability as a child, if he had just been properly nurtured. I mean, it's true that Wild Man Fisher is schizophrenic, but I think it's safe to say that his family life as a kid is what really set him off the track. Well, my life has not been all that pleasant. Because my father died when I was young, and my mother didn't love me, or didn't care about me. And eventually, I just broke away. My mother hates me. My sister despises me. My brother-in-law likes to throw darts at me. And it's really then that Larry started writing songs. I mean, all he could do to cope with his family problems was hide out in his room and make up songs to entertain himself. And his family missed the chance. If his mother, if his brothers, if his sisters had said, Good song, Larry. Hey, you're a great little singer, Larry. You really sing great. And wow, that's an yeah, it. Pursue a this. No, we didn't either encourage him or discourage him. Other than, you know, we told him we thought that these tunes would never probably go anywhere. Come on, let's merry go, merry go, merry go round. Boo, 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 merry go, merry go, merry go. Larry just had a musical compulsion. He just loved to sing. Music would just flow out of him. No matter where he was, in the middle of the night, he'd be making up songs. And his mother would tell him to shut up, and he would sing. And his mother would tell him to shut up even louder, and he would sing even louder. He said his whole family told him, you're crazy, you're crazy. Oh, they, they did not give him family love. Wild Man Fisher used to call us from Disneyland. He used to buy a year-long pass and go to Disneyland every day. And he went there to soak up family love. Well, she used to make me eat on the sink. You know, on the sink, you know, right? Norman and, and David and Joyce, they used to eat on the kitchen table, but they made me eat on the stand up and eat on the sink. Now, wouldn't you think that was... Uh, Why'd they do that? No idea. Uh, my mother used to do that to me. She didn't uh, My mother didn't... Uh, my mother didn't love me. My mother was someone who loved her children, who cared about her children, 
but she was over her head in trying to deal with her children. She just really wasn't uh, capable of doing that. If there's one person in this world that I would have killed, it would have been her, trust me. She was a sick woman, man. I fucking hated her guts, but I never did kill her. And she hit me several times. She was screaming and yelling at me, okay? Everything was, get in your room! Get in your room! She was screaming at me and giving me a heart, giving me a nothing but pain and misery, okay? I don't recall he had any favorite things to do other than his uh, singing. He didn't seem to have any favorite toys or things like that. He kept to himself in his room, didn't talk much. He's just extremely lonely and, and lost. Music, for Larry, was what kept him going, though. Song, music was his form of therapy. It's what kept him from going completely over the edge. If you take the music away from Larry, I'm not sure what you have left. To my knowledge, he had no peers. He had no friends. Right. So even as a little kid, he never had one play friend. Not that I ever saw. This song here is called The Wild Man Fisher Story. You rolling? You rolling? In the year of 1962, I got thrown out of school. Now listen, Larry, I'm the principal at this high school. You're not supposed to sing in class. What's wrong with singing in class? I think in the 11th grade, yeah, my second year at Fairfax in high school, yeah. You went to Fairfax High School? Yeah, Fairfax High School. And I got, I got thrown out of there. For what? I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Oh, okay. Let me sing another song. All right. Let's sing. A, can you sing us a song? Gonna, I have a powerful voice. Now watch all these people start coming in. Oh, Larry. We're going to have to do something about Larry, David. He's driving me nuts, David. I can't stand him another day, David. We're going to have to do something. Why don't you commit him? Great idea. So tell us about the mental hospital, what that was like. Well, I was in the mental hospital when I was, uh, when I was 16 years old because my mother committed me for breaking a window in the house. He came after my mom with a knife. For what reason, I have no idea. What did David tell you, that I came at my mother with a knife? I came at her with something, yeah. I think I did, I don't remember, but I came at her with something. She was screaming at me. What do you do if your mother's screaming at you and calling you every name in the book? We had to pull him off of her, which she was very scared, very frightened. And then he also... One day he came at me with a knife for any reason that I can figure out. I didn't realize I had done anything to trigger it. And it was just decided that he was too dangerous to keep at the house. In the year of 1963, I was committed to a mental institution. It was a nightmare. You didn't get along with people there? Would you get along with people that pissed and shit on the floor all day long and start screaming and talking to themselves? Mommy, mommy. Would you get along with people like that? You didn't, you didn't exactly care for it, did you? No, I didn't. How did, but, the, uh, how did the staff there treat you? They treat you like they treat everybody. They medicate you every day with Thorazine. Put shots up my ass and shit. You, you ever, ever had a shot, shot up your ass? Did they ever give you shock therapy? Oh, my God. Oh, oh I think I, I... No, I don't think they did. I, they were giving him shock treatments, and he didn't feel they were helping him. And They were giving him shock treatments. They did all kinds of things to me. Like, I was like a guinea pig. <laughs> all kinds of shots and all kinds of medications to calm me down, you know what I mean? Larry, you'll never be normal. They say you're a paranoia schizophrenic. People used to say about schizophrenia that it was characteristic of it to have a lack of an attentional filter so that all kinds of sensory input and all kinds of thoughts, all kinds of ideas were just flooding into the person's consciousness. And there was a kind of blooming, buzzing confusion. Well, your mind is... My mind goes to all kinds of different thoughts while I'm talking. While I'll you're be thinking talking about, to people? I'll, I'll be thinking about things that happened in 1960. 61, I'll be thinking about things in 1960 cluttering in my brain all at the same time. As you're talking to somebody. As I'm talking to people, my brain is wondering. It's, that's, it's strange. And I wish I didn't have a hand like a ping pong ball. I got a hand like a ping pong ball. 
And I wish I didn't have a head like a ping pong ball. Then I would be a star. I got a head like a ping pong ball. <laughs> oh, I wish I didn't have a head like a ping pong ball. Because if I had a head that wasn't like a ping pong ball, <laughs> I'd be like... There are a lot of different reasons why people are drawn to Larry's music. One of them is a little bit like the reason why people a century or two ago would go sometimes to the asylums to look at the patients. It's a kind of voyeurism to stare at this person who seems so weird and so uninhibited. But a second reason, of course, is that we are really moved by what he says and the story that he tells of his life and of his sufferings. They're fighting each other. It's like a disease, Frank. Oh, in the year of 1964, I was released from the mental institution. He was only institutionalized once, and I know of what happened was he ran away from the institution. I went up to Oregon and got him and brought him back. But he never lived back at the house after he was institutionalized. And... He had really no communication with his mom that I know of, very little. She just didn't want to see him. I mean, she was just really afraid of him and wanted absolutely nothing to do with him after that. All right, this is the Invincible Man, see? Tell us about the Invincible Man. I thought about being a cartoonist, and this Invincible Man gets his energy from his mother being mad at him and stuff, yelling at him, and that makes him invincible. Whenever he gets where he's lost his invincibility, his mother will make him Mother, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to become a big singing star. Don't talk about that! In the year of 1966, I was committed to the mental institution again. In the year of 1968, have I made a mistake? Will I end up a bum? Will I end up a crumb? Will I end up in hell? Will I end up in jail? Will I end up in Jesus? Will I end up in trees? Will I end up rich, 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 rich? Wild man Fisher, wild man Fisher. Merry go, merry go, merry go round. Poop, 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 merry go. Something's going on. Right. Merry go round. I've seen psychiatrists for pills. Something's going on. Somebody out there wants me. It's been hell, okay? Well, that... All right, Something all right. Something's going on. Tell me what's going on. Somebody out there don't like me. And I mean somebody big time. With lots of money to, no, to do this. It's not true. Oh, yeah. And another guy, I said to him, I think, uh, who's trying to kill me? And the guy says to me, Stephen... <laughs> Stephen Stills? No, no. Steven Spielberg? Yeah. Steven Spielberg is the one? He just, I, I, he said I would be dead within an hour or two, and I, I freaked out. I can't seem to guess what's going, when they're going, when, 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 what's going to happen. What's going to happen to me? When it's going to happen to me? They've got me so frightened. And I just don't know when they're going to do, what's going to happen, when it's going to happen, where it's going to happen. I have to hide everywhere. I'm telling you, this is scary. Which way did the freaks go? Which way did they go? Get your original songs here. Get them before the world gets them. Growing up in Los Angeles in the 60s, we were both aware of Wildman Fisher being a permanent fixture on the scene. First time I saw him, he was wearing kind of like a dashiki with these yellow pants, and he had one flip-flop on one foot, and the other foot was bare. He would come up to you if you were hanging out at the beach, and you'd say, do you want to hear a song for a dime? Get your original songs here. Original songs for sale. So would you like to hear an original song for a dime? I swear to God it's original. So then you would pay him a dime and he would sing. Oh, I'm walking down 
down the street, and nobody's happy. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. No, they're not. They're not happy. They're not snappy. Larry performed on the Sunset Strip back in the 60s for all the hippies and instantly developed a cult following. Word started to spread about this crazy street performer. Everybody knew about him. You like my singing? Huh? Yeah. Is it good? Awesome. You listen to most pop music and it's very contrived. But with Wild Man Fisher, even when he's working on something and thinking about it, it's coming from a pure place. At his best, he's mainlined right into this creative, kind of subconscious. Fisher, in, in many ways, to me, is a poster child for outsider music. Outsider music is a, a slippery genre. It's musicians who tend to be self-taught, untrained, working certainly way outside the channels of mainstream music. Artists like Captain Beefheart. The dust blows forward and the dust blows back. And the wind blows Like black. Daniel Johnston and Wesley Willis. Suck it, thank you, Swillies! Suck it, thank you, Swillies! Suck it, Tiny Tim. But Tiny Tim, obviously, became very famous. The very important qualifications, they are sincere about it. They're genuine. They mean it. They're not doing it to be funny. They're not doing it to be outrageous. This is a sincere Berlinda's. musical expression. I tried to tell her the truth, but her mother was near the window. Oh, Linda! No, Lori! Oh, Linda! No, Lori! The appeal of Larry's music is that it's real, is that you're hearing something that is, is the musical vision of one singular human being rather than music that was created by a committee that really comes from the heart and soul of an individual. Let us live as one, tadu, tadu. Let us sing to the sun, tadu, tadu. I want a new direction to replace the old direction. Bring you some chest bites, rope in some new dice. Let us hope and pray, tadu, tadu. For some better days, tadu, tadu. really stretched the limits on what behavior was acceptable. I noticed that people started acting crazier. I mean, you know, more things were permissible having Larry around. He really did have an effect on people. He really was a kind of a spaced out role model for a lot of my friends for a while. The thing about Los Angeles, there were freaks here, and there were different kinds of freaks, and freaks are people that have figured out a way to in spite of society, express themselves. And so Larry is just another one of the freaks. I, I went to a talent night in East LA, and a guy named Solomon Burke was there. You ever heard of Solomon Burke? Of course. And he liked me a whole lot. He liked me a whole lot and called me Wild Man Fisher. He said, knock him at the park, Wild Man. It had to be wild. We named him Wild Man Fisher. <laughs> and he took me with him to San Francisco, and uh, David put Justin's name in I don't. I don't. It's kind of depressing, because he turned me on to some women, and I couldn't have, it was, it was like, Why did you put my cut was too tight, I didn't have no sex with her. Keep pushing, don't stop, don't give up on yourself. Remember, where there's a will, there's a way, and keep your hands in God's hands, and it'll happen for you, Larry. I jacked off on the rats. <laughs> Historically, there have been several kinds of images of madness that have been prominent, really going back to the ancient Greeks and up really practically to the present. One is the image of the wild man, 
the person who's devoid of any social conventions or social controls, who is a kind of a pure expression of the id or the, the instinctual impulse. There's a new dance going round the land. Come on, everybody, do the wild man. Throw your arms up, pretend you're a child. That's it now, you're getting wild. Stand on your head, you're doing it right. After Larry was dubbed Wild Man Fisher, he was fucking unstoppable. I used to audition for NBC. I used to go down and do a lot of auditions, OK? You want to hear my story about my, all my auditions? Yep. OK. The first audition I went on was for Rowan and Martin's Laugh-In. And I got it. Ladies and gentlemen, the choir director of the beautiful downtown Burbank Glee Club. exposed on national TV, don't you think he'll fly to stardom? From there, what's her name? Ruth Buzzy drags me Ruth off. You know. Come on, let Mary go. Let me go. Mary go round. Boop, boop, boop. Mary go. Mary go. Mary go round. I say, let me. I saw Ruth Buzzy give me a dirty look in a market. She recognized me. She gave you a dirty look. Oh, she starts saying, oh, that guy's a bum or whatever. I don't know what you were saying. Somebody said there's wild. You know, Ruth Buzzy's more of a celebrity than I am. Not really. What, what do you mean, not really? She's been in more TV shows than I have. But, you know, a lot, most people don't know who she is. More people know who I am than Ruth Buzzy? Come on. That's not true. And Larry often asks me where he ranks. It's always a kind of competition with him. I'm a lot more famous than the Rugburns. But the Rugburns are as good as me. They're as good as me. Like the other day, he asked me, uh, come on, Buckley, who's better, me or David Bowie? This is ground control to Major Tom. I got my helmet on. Yeah. I got my helmet on. On the one hand, his singing and his way of making music suggests that he's not at all interested in conforming in the ways that we would be necessary to have conventional kind of success. My it's as if he's saying, well, I'm doing this for myself and in my own way, and I don't really care what the response of the world is to it. But at the same time, he's almost fixated on fame. I'm unknown in San Diego. Are you, is, is this on? No one's ever heard of me before in San Diego. Oh, the people have heard of the Rugburns, but they haven't heard of me. And I'm more famous than the Rugburns. I'm famous in Germany, England, everywhere. And the Rugburns are only famous here. Larry, no full well that you may be bigger than all those guys you were worried were bigger than you. You may be the biggest one of all the people that you always ask me who is bigger, the Go-Go's, or Larry Fisher, or Frank Zappa, or Larry Fisher. You may be the biggest of all of us. I'm Wild Man Fisher, I'm a rock star, okay? Did you ever hear of Wild Man Fisher albums? That's you? Yeah. Yeah. Zappa? Mm -hmm. Okay. I go down to the welfare department, I get the money, and everybody says you're a bum fisher, ha ha ha. But then I keep going, and my father's dead, oh my father's dead. I was in a mental institution when I was 16 years old. I met Frank Zappa no. in front of Canners years ago. The musician told him, you got to hear this guy, he's original. And Frank told me that he could make me a rock star. And uh, if Frank Zappa told you that, would you think you might be able to become a rock star? <laughs> Zappa heard Larry singing on Sunset Boulevard and spent time listening to Larry, talking to Larry, getting to know Larry. 
and the more information that Frank Zappa got out of Wildman Fisher, the more he realized that there's a bigger story here, and there's a bigger musical story. You bring back those memories of my dear old Taggy Lee. There's some people that they break that mold, and in that moment, they're really who they are, and Frank could always pull that out of somebody, and he could always recognize it when it was there. I know a guy, his name is Manson. He's tall, he's dark, he's real, real handsome. He wanted to make a record like it was never made before. He liked to shock people, right? Mm -hmm. And he figured if he made a record with me, it would shock people. And it did at first, they didn't know what to make of it, right? I was working for Warner Brothers in the 1970s, and at that time they distributed the bizarre and straight record labels that Frank Zappa had founded. And one of the artists that he signed was, of course, Wild Man Fisher for this unprecedented double album, An Evening with Wild Man Fisher. Come on, let's merry go, merry go, merry go round. Have you seen the album cover for An Evening with Wild Man Fisher? Is that the one where he has a knife? Yeah. And going after his mother sort of thing? What was your reaction to seeing that album cover? Especially since that event really happened. I thought it was kind of a sad thing to see. But I guess that was just part of the merchandising and the, and the sale of the album. It's not something you like to see. One thing that you must remember about Wildman Fisher is that he actually is a wild person. And uh, Larry is dangerous. He has brothers and other relatives, and some of them have been attacked by Larry. He, he loved it. He, he said if he ever had a son, he wanted his son to be just like me. He said that. I swear to God, he said that. So if he ever had a son, he wanted him to be like me. And he also said he traveled all over the world, and there's only one wild man fisher. I'm not kidding, he said that. And I said, this, this record's not going to sell. Uh, what's going to happen in my career? He goes, maybe, maybe not, but, you know, it doesn't sell. You know. Go out and do it. Go out and tour. We hired him to perform at a concert in Spokane. We just thought it would be real funny to bring him up, you know. We just did it for laughs, actually. When I met him, I thought, wow, this guy looks exactly like he does on the record album. He was wearing one glove, which was years before Michael Jackson thought of that. Larry would walk around Spokane during the day to amuse himself. And one day, he went over by Gonzaga University, and he just walked up to this guy's house and knocked on the door and said, uh, maybe you've heard of me. I'm." Larry Wildman Fisher, and the guy goes, yeah, you know, I have heard of you. And he says, well, would it be okay if I came in and used your bathroom? And the guy goes, yeah, okay. And so Larry went inside, the guy showed him where the bathroom was, and he went in, and quite a bit of time went by. And when the guy got worried about him and came back and knocked on the bathroom door, Larry wasn't there anymore. And he looked around the house for him and eventually found him hiding in a closet and Larry had relieved himself in the closet and this guy was so taken by it and was such a Wild Man Fisher fan that he actually preserved the, the uh, stool of Wild Man Fisher and put up a sign as an exhibit and later on people would actually pay admission to come in the house and look at the closet where the stool was preserved of Wild Man Fisher. And for all I know, it's still there because, you know, it was there 10 years ago. And 10 years isn't a very long time when you're talking about a relic like that. Have you ever heard my first album all the way through? Oh, yeah. All the way through? All the way through. They thought my first album, there'll never be another one like it. What do you think? I think that an evening with first double album that Frank Zappa produced for Larry is a standalone brilliant piece of work. It caught Larry with his most passionate material 
he truly he was on the upswing. Right? right, he was on an upswing. He he saw the potential to become what he wanted to become, to become Bobby Vinton, to become, you know, bigger than the Beatles, to become bigger than Dylan. I'm going around your house, baby. Just like a circle, yeah. A triangle, a triangle, a triangle, a triangle, baby. So, Larry, what was the highlight of your career, man? You know, you ain't gonna believe this. The highlight of my career was when I sang at the Rose Bowl, the American Music Show, with Janis Joplin, uh, Everly Brothers, uh, Joan Baez, Buffy St. Marie, the birds, the birds were really good. Oh, boy, it was an awesome show. I was on that show. I'm going around. I'm going upside down, inside up and down and back and round and up and up and down and up and round and up that down. Double into that down like a circle, baby! by Frank Zappa, there was thousands of people screaming, screaming. I was seeing 10,000 people cheering me. It made me feel, wow, wow, this, this, you, know, you, know, you know what I mean? You feel like you were arriving. <laughs> At first, I wanted to be a rock star. Can you blame me? I was going to have a nice house, a nice high life, make my family proud of me and be a rock star. But, uh, my dreams of becoming a rock star never, never really happened. The main reason why I got into the music business in the first place was to impress my family, earn a living, complete my dream, and by making an album, I thought all my troubles would be over. I thought that's all you had to do was make the album. That's when my troubles began. After he recorded Evening With, he went on a tour to support it. But when he got back, he found out he only sold 12,000 copies of it. Frank assumed that it would, it would sell some records and enjoy some success. And Larry assumed that it would sell in the millions. But you know what people tell me? Your record bombed, Larry. I've had people tell me that. Fucking freaking record bombed. I spent three months working on the Wild Man Fisher album. And uh, at the end of that time, not only was I accused of uh, robbing Wild Man Fisher and cheating Wild Man Fisher and abusing him, most of this from Wild Man Fisher himself, but uh, the album itself did not sell a large amount of copies. You know, Larry, I'm sure, has a very kind of consistent loop yeah. <laughs> that it's like plays. A tape loop, yep. And a lot of it is Zappa and his experiences in the late 60s with Frank. <laughs> well, I never became a rock star. At the... But Frank Zappa fired me. That's it. Well, the moment that changed everything between Larry and Frank was in a fit of frustration at Frank's studio or home, Larry was just frustrated, and we've seen him this way many times. You want me to talk about my family, too? You son of a bitch. We've seen him throw a television set. He threw a bottle. And the bottle, as we have been told, came very close to hitting Moon when she was a little baby. And that was and it. Frank felt like, yeah, I don't need this stuff in it, my the life. The plug was pulled immediately. Right, it was right. like, wait a minute. You well, threw a bottle and it almost hit my baby. Yeah. And he thought with me, right, it would be like, fuck, an original kind of record, right? Am I right? But then he screwed me. It was an immediate, boom, this. that's it. You are done. You right. are so done. Get out. And so from that moment on, it was like, ba 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 Here's a song about an old friend of mine called Frank. Yeah! <laughs> Frank's got money in the bank. Frank's got women he can spank. Frank owns my public cigarettes. You can say he's on my mind. Think about him all the time. <laughs> Frank, do <laughs> I had Frank Zappa as a guest on my show several times. And one time was right after the Wild Man Fisher album had appeared that had the song Frank on it. And I decided that one of the things I do when Frank came to the studio that day was to play him that song and get his reaction to it. Frank's got money in the bank. Frank's got women he can spank. Unbeknownst to me, Frank had never heard the song before. He had not known that it existed. 
and he was just livid. He just turned purple with rage. He said, did you know that that man threatened my life? Did you know that that man tried to have me killed? How, how dare anybody put out a song like that by that man? And it was all that I and my producer could do to keep Frank from canceling the interview right there. And he also got me to agree that I would not play the song Frank again. You know, I spent three months of my time working on the Wild Man Fisher album, and I thought I'd done a good job on it, and I, I was proud of the album when it was done. But then it wind up with, uh, it hurts my feelings, you know. So, Larry, after you and Zappa parted ways, you disappeared for like eight years. What did you do between 69 and 77? I decided to quit. Mm -hmm. Did he get any jobs? Yeah, I got, I got a job. I got a bunch of jobs, and I got fired. Can you tell us what the jobs were? Different jobs. Like what? Loading and unloading trucks and stuff. What else? I know you did some Selling work. pins on the telephone. How did that work out for you? What happened with that? They fired me. Why? It's because they didn't like the way I was, they heard my talking, they didn't like the way I talked. I was a failure as a rock star. I, I failed, you know? Had they ever heard of you before they hired you? No, they never heard of me. Most people have never heard of me. When you sold pens on the phone, when you just called up these random people, did you just start They talking? gave me the numbers to call. Yeah. They don't, you know, you just... And did you start talking about, like, your music to the people on the phone? No, I said, please, buy these pens. Frank used to be a good friend. I think about him all the time. You could say he's on my mind. Frank! After Larry threw the bottle at Moon Unit, Frank Zappa's daughter, everything went to shit. His contract with Frank Zappa went to shit. Larry's home life went to shit. Then Larry decided to walk into Rhino Records. You want to hear how I started a multi-million dollar empire? Yes, let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. They have nice people there. They'll show you where the records are. Where are the records? They're over there. Go to Rhino Records. You ever heard that song before? Yep. That's the first song that was ever done for Rhino Records. Did you know that? Tell, I started a multi-million dollar company. It. Tell us about tell I us became story. Rhino Records' mascot. Think about it, right? I'm Rhino Records' mascot on a song called Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. Is that a good song? Tell us the story of Rhino Records, of how you got onto Rhino Records. I walked into Rhino Records, and the clerk at the store said, aren't you Wild Man Fisher? And I go, yeah. Oh, you're our favorite singer. And he said, can you create a jingle for the store? And I went, Rhino Records, right? Yeah. And I wrote that song right there on the spot. You can get Herb Albert and Jackie Lomax for 40 cents. Do -do -do -do. Get Jackie Lomax and Herb Alpert for 40 cents, which is, you know, an observation and humor. And then when you go, da do da do, <laughs> like celebrating, like, you know, with the trumpets, that, oh, 40 cents? I mean, it's Supreme Wild Man. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. Go to Rhino Records. And they tape record it and couple six months later they, they liked the song they released it as a 45. The very first single was Wildman Fisher's Go to Rhino Records. What happened was there was a, a DJ in England, a very famous underground DJ called John Peel, and he started playing the record and he got so much response that we actually got orders from England. And in John Peel's year end amongst a lot of the popular recordings like Brown Sugar by the Rolling Stones, number 48 was Go to Rhino Records by Wild Man Fisher. After that, we started making other records, and, uh, and then we made our first album. It was Wild Mania, it was Rhino 001. Da -do, da -do. The voices of conscience, the Bob Dylan, the political voices, were quiet, and music had turned to concert rock. And there were bands like Styx and Foreigner and Kansas who were doing like music where the politics were, I'm horny, I'm stupid, I'm white, I'm a conspicuous consumer, and I'm proud of it. 
or it was disco, which was kind of like a beautiful girl with a great body but no brains. And Wild Man Fisher represented kind of a rejection of all the notions of pop culture and pop music and was probably one of the few voices at the time that was the voice of inspiration. Eating and sleeping, eating and sleeping, eating and sleeping. That's what you got to do to live. You can't live without it. Eating and sleeping, eating and sleeping. That's what you got to do to live. Eating and sleeping, eating and sleeping. That's what you got to do to live. That's a new song. You like it, Josh? Oh, oh love it. Okay. Love it. You never know when I'm going to record a jam, huh? Why don't you record a new song? Can we record a new song right now? We told you yeah. to write a song about something. Well, give me a name. That's, I, that, that's what I'm good at. Because that's what Gigi. they did, right? Write a song about Gigi. Gigi, 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 Gigi. Oh, Gigi, I could sing Gigi forever, Gigi. Gigi, 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 Gigi. Oh, Gigi, Gigi, see Gigi, Gigi, see Gigi, Gigi, Gigi. Can't get up a Gigi, 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 Gigi. You're singing along now, Gigi. <laughs> not bad. That is good. I'm catching. I'm creating it, even though I'm depressed and thinking everyone's trying to kill me. Well, the thing to understand about Larry is that you never know what you're going to get with him. Hopefully, you'll get good stuff when he has the pep up, as he calls it. The triple pep is when Larry has the high highs and he's writing and recording and, and he's singing and oh, I got a new song. I got, the trip, I got the triple pep. Yeah, he would say, push the button. I got the triple pep. And then pep. a minute later, as is what happens with people with this problem. He right. would just like, you know, it would drain out, and it, yeah. just like that. You snap your fingers, and he like, sit in the chair. For me, I'd say that the, the pep is kind of like the upper side of bipolarism. It's a creative feeling. It's a rush, and it's not something you can call up on demand. It's something that just kind of comes on you. Her name is Joyce. I love you, Joyce. I love you too, Larry. My name is Larry. My name is Larry. I've seen it come on him, and I've seen him really work a crowd and have every single one of them responding to him positively. So when he's performing and when he's got the pep, he's one of the greatest entertainers you'd ever see in your life. I like the pilot! shared an enjoyment for left of center entertainment. We would write 10 or 20 songs in a day and spend the whole day recording weird, funny songs. Yeah, and we wanted to do stuff that was uh, a little more out there, shall we say. Roly bully fish heads are never seen drinking cappuccino in Italian restaurants with Oriental women. Just like I have for the last 25 or so years, uh, every week I listen to 15 or 20 new submissions for the Dr. Demento show. Oh, yes. And that is Dennis with an exclamation point, the rare seven inch. And our friends would say, send it to Dr. Demento. We sent him off fish heads and we became unknowingly or unwittingly kind of like the reigning gods of dementia for a couple of years. Mm. And, and uh... Until Weird Al came along. <laughs> The first time I ever heard Larry's music was listening to Dr. Demento's show, and he was playing the song, My Name is Larry, every week. My name is Larry. And I remember My telling you, that you got to hear this song. It'll blow you away. It did. I mean, that and was... And that was it. For that, us. Was, that was certainly the catalyst for Barnes & Barnes to passionately seek Larry out. I think Barnes & Barnes are better than Frank Shep. <laughs> <laughs> they attached themselves so much to Larry, and they were so into him. And they were also so musical. 
that I just felt that they would do a really good job as far as bringing out the best of Larry. You were pretty good I back then. I used to be that good. You were that good back then. Is that surprising? No. Am I, I right? You were talented. Am I right? Were you that kid on Lost in Space? I'm gonna, gonna, gonna take a cab. These are the original tapes from our first project with Larry. We haven't heard them in, in over 20 years. I love my little city, yeah, little or else. It's like his L.A. woman, man. <laughs> we should have finished this. The Beatles this. had good imagination when they were younger. Am I right? Yeah. Do the work. Make it squirm. Well, the thing about dealing with Larry is there's a lot of frustration. Quite often he would show up late, or he would show up other times when you couldn't really get much out of him. He would start songs, and then he would abort them. And he'd go, I'm quitting show business. And you go, no, don't quit it now. Quit it in about an hour from now. You know, Because he would quit show business about two or three times a week. It's like he'd come up and go, Mark, I'm quitting show business. Do you blame me? I go, no, I don't blame you. It's an awful business. You've got to have three things. you got to have talent, you got to have luck, and you got to have persistence. And he'd just keep going on and on and go in these loops, and then he'd call you up later that day, and he'd go, Mark, I'm back. I could do more shows. But Miguel, I would really want to get out of this business. It's, it's what would you rather do? I'd like to get back in the business. Fish head, fish head, roly poly fish head. Eat them up, yum! Eat them up, yum! The one thing you can say about Larry's recording sessions is they're atypical to working with just about anybody else. I think Billy Mooney was kind of on to the right idea when he did things like tried to let Wild Man record in his own environment. Well, here's a new song I've been working on called Dazzling Departure. It's been a dazzling departure from what the other things I've done. This is a dazzling departure from anything else I've ever done. Oh, a dazzling, 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 dazzling departure. You like that? Being in the confines of a recording studio was not the way to get the best out of Larry. Larry likes to roam around and have space when he's being creative. So I got this stereo recording unit, and I used to pick Larry up, and he was so paranoid. He'd be riding shotgun with a pair of rusty scissors. Be Larry for a minute. I wasn't around for the uh, scissors episode. I'm driving the car, and Wild Man Fisher is riding shotgun with me, holding a pair of scissors <laughs> over my head, going, you're a music business shark. You're a shark art. Yeah, and he's <laughs> holding scissors on me. Oh and my I'm God. walking around with these mics, recording all of these vocals. Try Last Man in the City one more time. I feel like the last man in the city, living deep in downtown LA. I would get these stereo vocals, bring them back to the studio, and then we'd score them like we it was a movie. Score them. Oh, I'm walking through the park, this nice, lovely park. I mean, I couldn't believe it. He was combusting with these songs, and, and they weren't 10-second songs. They were they were a minute long at least. <laughs> <laughs> they were full-on Larry great moments. It was it was really inspiring. First song we recorded was "Pronounced Normal," which went on to become the title the album. Certified Raw, Choice B, Fresh Daily, Pronounced Normal. Open what was so depressing was we worked really hard on "Pronounced Normal." It was truly us wanting to give Larry a Sergeant Pepper. We worked really hard on it, and when it was all done, mixed, finished, and given to Larry. Instead of it pleasing him, it freaked him out. And that was the only time in my life that I was dangerous. I scared so many people. I, I thought I was going to kill myself even.
Every Sorry. time something positive is about to happen, and certainly when it's about to happen on a professional level, like an album being released or a concert planned, Larry's paranoia just kicks in. Okay, I only had no, one it's, episode it's, like that. Okay, because you know what set it off? Well, because he thought he heard subliminal messages in a lot of the songs that weren't that obviously weren't were there. were not there. I swear to God, in my children's lives, they were not there. It says it's going to be a bad circumcise. You know where it says pronounced normal? I, I am. You are. are. It's going to be a bad circumcise. I thought they were going to try to cut my dick off. Is circumcised where they cut your dick off and throw it in the ocean or something? Larry thought he heard a voice on that circus music that said, this is going to be a bad circumcision. Right. So he thought we were trying to cut off his penis, but it wasn't true. It wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> I thought in Bullia Base, I would be in the ocean and the fish were eating me up and the sharks were eating me up and, uh... No, no, if you ever get mad, I don't say anything bad. Right, you promise me that? <laughs> I get real paranoid sometimes. You know, you get on the show and say, I'm mad at Larry. I don't like it. It's going to be a bad circumcise. You would circumcise me. They don't cut your dick or nothing. What do they do when you circumcise? What do they do? They just take a little piece of the skin on your penis that's not needed. Like, that's right? all? Yeah. And they don't cut your dick off or nothing no, when it's a circumcise? Even... No, that's it. Do the worm. Make it squirm. I really, no, I really believe this. The Dr. Demento, Herbie Cohn, Warner Brothers Records put a contract on my life. I freaked out. I was supposed to do a show with Weird Al and Dr. Demento. I was going to be on the show, and they canceled me from the show. They wanted me to be Dr. Demento. Ah, this is getting, you know, we, they canceled me from the show. I really, no, I really thought people were trying to kill me. I'm not trying to kill you! No, I had never heard the story that I was supposed to be involved in any uh, plot to chop off Larry's penis and throw it in the ocean. That's a new one on me. I, it, it makes sense, I suppose. Do you know I was trying to buy a real gun? I really was. Damn. And my plan was I was going to shoot Dr. Demento. And I was going to shoot Billy... Mo Is Dr. Demento... No, I had no... Guy? I thought... No, I was going to shoot Dr. Demento and I was going to shoot Billy Mummy Man. So I bought a BB gun that looked real. Not only that, Billy Mummy comes over to my house with, with Robert, right? And I pull out the fucking gun, and it looked real. <laughs> I mean, it looked really real. And Billy goes, oh, and Robert goes, oh, my God. You know? I said, look, you guys, were you planning on to kill me? I just want to know the truth on this. Hell no. You know, and they finally figured, that ain't real, is it? <laughs> Man. I almost went to a nut house for that. I was lucky. The conspiracy in Larry's mind, uh, in his mind, it was Barnes and Barnes, Dr. Demento. Weird Al. Weird Al Yankovic. My first album had a song called I'll Be Mellow When I'm Dead. And Larry heard that song on the radio. And there's one line in the song that says, like wow, man, can you relate? And Larry had me in front and says, oh, what do you mean? Did you say like wild man, can you relate? Like wild man, can you relate? I'll be mellow when I'm dead. I'll be mellow when I'm dead. You're trying to kill me, Al? You're trying to kill me, aren't you, Al? And, no, Larry, I'm not trying to kill you. You're trying to kill me, Al. Like wild man, can you relate? I'll be mellow when I'm dead. I'll be mellow when I'm dead. I'll be mellow. thing was after that crazy episode Larry had Barnes and Barnes actually fucking asked him to do another record months went by after pronounced normal and Larry freaked out and finally he started surfacing again and calling again 
and calming down again. We decided to go back for more, and we were going to make Larry another album. And you think Billy Mummy would never be my friend again? You think, you know, you would just, no way, you know? And he still wanted to be my friend. This one was going to be, you know, an album to make the last album look like a piece of nothing. And he said, don't put anything scary on this no, one. Nothing, nothing scary. scary. That's why they call the album Nothing Scary. Why do you think he called it that? Think about it. Don't ever get mad at me. I'll never get mad at you because we're friends. We'll always be friends. So make My me major real motivation to do Nothing Scary was to do what we set out to, to do please with, him with, and with uh, make him happy. Normal, which was to give him something that mm. in the end he would be happy mm -hmm. and proud of and not scared of. I forget, was he? <laughs> you could never get him to be happy with anything that happened. You know, he, he would, it would be momentary, any kind of happiness. And he would then spin off into his paranoid fantasies of what he thought was really going on with the entertainment industry. When I first met him, pretty much I would just see this big lurking guy in the hallway rambling on the payphone to someone about how the music business has destroyed me, screwed me over. Larry never seemed to have any money, no matter how many albums the guy was doing. So it was beyond me as if they do an album on somebody, and if it's not successful, why are you doing another? And what was he supposed to get out of it? I mean, he certainly was very upset and bitter about it. The nature of what he does is never going to sell a million records. It's never going to make him rich. It's been a constant complaint of Larry's that it doesn't make him rich. It's a money world. It's a money world. It's a money world. It's a money world. I couldn't believe it, because fuck, in the year 2000, Rhino Records became the world's largest independent record company. The very first single was Wildman Fisher's Go to Rhino Records. They finalized a multi-million dollar licensing deal with Warner Brothers. Show business is really hard. You really can't trust very many people. Rhino Records, and most people have taken advantage of me. Here's a song I wrote about the music business. I have been derailroaded, derailroaded by everybody. Well, from what I understand, Larry is still living exactly the same way he has for 30 years or more. Moving from one big bag hotel to another. Money occupies your mind. Money can buy your soul. Money is how you find. It's a money world. I wish to announce that thing is money. I really don't think Larry no. was burned. You get rich, you make money if you sell units. So you went from 12,000 on Bazaar to about 6,000 on Wild Mania, 3,000 on Pronounced Normal, and then Nothing Scary did well under 2,000. Nobody and bought that Nobody, record. right, exactly. So, it's a cult classic, but you know. So nobody I mean, owes him any money. But Larry gets very paranoid about, you're oh, ripping Larry, me off. Absolutely. Everybody's yeah. ripping me off. The entertainment industry is a big septic tank, and it stinks, but it's also an exciting one. It's an exciting septic tank, and Larry, for all his lack of personal defenses and all his frailties, he chose to keep jumping into it over and over again, you know. Almost every time you heard he was putting on another record, you'd go, oh, no. But, you know, he's kind of a brave, driven guy. I don't want to be a rock singer no more. I'm tired of it. It's a horrifying experience. It's uh... It's, it's, it's a nightmare. It's, it's, it's not as good as you think it is. It's, it's a... Don't you like being a singer? Well, people use singers. You know, it's like it's, like, it's a business. You know, it's like it, it's a... It's a business, you know? I have been derailroaded, derailroaded by everyone. I have been set on the tracks to wander like a fool. Oh, I have been derailroaded, 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 derailroaded. It's clear that uh, a person like Larry is going to have great difficulty fashioning a career because he's so volatile, he's so unstable. The thunderstorms that are going on inside his head cannot make him an easy person to work with. I wrote him a letter and I said, look, Larry, what is with you? I hear you're mad about these stories, these comic stories, and that you deny them, but then you've told other people that they're true. So nobody's making up anything about you. And you can't accuse me of, you know, taking money away from you because I made very little money doing this. And so then he wrote me back this letter. Dear Denny, I like you. You are a nice guy. Why do you write lies about me? He's kind of got this habit of being pissed off at everybody. You know, I quit show business 
I hate show business. It's full of crooks, and you're one of them, a nice crook. Your friend, Larry. Kind of hurt my feelings. I, I think the only one that has escaped that is he's not pissed off at, at Barnes and Barnes. I guess it was during the Nothing Scary sessions. Larry would have a tendency, you know, he would do a take. It was hard to get him just to stand in front of the mic for two or three minutes to do a take. But then we would always try and push him. Do another one, Larry. Come on, get you can do it better. Because he'd go sit down in a chair, and, you know, and get depressed or whatever. And Larry was having a hard time with it. And he freaked. And he hit Robert. It didn't hurt me, but it was like, scared me. He's a big guy. I don't need this. It's like, OK, I've already done my two albums with Larry. It's like, I'm out of here. I'm done. And that was pretty much Robert's... That might have been the last time I worked with him, except for it's a hard business. A song that we recorded with Larry and the great Rosemary Clooney back in 1986. Rosemary Clooney was a very dear, close friend of mine. Gonna take a sentimental journey. A year or two after Gonna Nothing Scary, Rosemary said to us, I think it would make Larry really happy if he and I recorded a duet together. Great. <laughs> and, and, and I honestly said, Rosemary, you don't want to do that. And she said, yes, I do. Rosemary, I'm thinking of quitting this impossible business. Oh, really, Larry? I hope not. It's just too hard. It's a hard business. Please tell me that you agree. It's a hard business. It's hard for you and hard for me. It's a hard business. Reaching way down in your soul. It's a hard business. I spoke with Larry almost on a daily basis for 21 years. Larry had my phone number and called almost daily, sometimes 20 <laughs> times a day, sometimes not for a week or two. But I have to probably lay claim to the fact of being the longest relationship in Larry's life. What was the best part about working with Barnes & Barnes? I got to see Billy Mummy and, and, and I got to, someone to talk to. <laughs> That's the best part. That's the best part of working with those guys. <laughs> really. Billy Mummy was your best friend at the time. Well, someone to talk to, yeah. I love Larry. I do. I mean, I really love the man. I have changed my phone number in the last few months because Larry, in one of his fits of unhappiness, was calling and hanging up on us all night long for seven weeks. I gave him like seven weeks before I changed the number because I didn't want to change the number. I didn't want to really disconnect from Larry because I feel I was an important relationship to him and a thread to some positive energy. And I felt obligated to maintain the friendship there. Larry, why don't you and Bill Mooney speak anymore? <laughs> Just tear this up, you know that? <laughs> oh, Larry. <laughs> oh, okay. All oh. right, we're done. All right, we're done, we're done. All right, no more. What was the lowest you've ever seen Larry? The, the lowest I see him is when he's just uh, very lonely. He really doesn't have any friends that I know of. And he keeps to himself in his room. And uh, he just seems to want to hide from the world to me. I'm living inside the house temporarily, you know that, right? He's a very frustrating person to try and deal with the whole family. No one's been able to, no one wants him to move in with them. First of all, he's kind of unpredictable. And secondly, he gets on your nerves. Do you want to sing a song, David? No. Just, you going to find ways for me to make a million dollars again? No, 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 I just, I said you do. No, I just said, you know. I want to make a million dollars. Yeah, if you took me in, you know, who knows? There's potential there. You can manage me, you know, manage my career and stuff. I mean, wouldn't you love that? I, mean, I know. Why, you don't want to manage? Oh. I think he's going to go now, right? Uh, yes. I'll see you. Okay. okay, that's it for David. 
How would you say being Wildman Fisher's brother has affected your life? How has it affected my life? Well, I've tried uh, not to let it affect my life. You know, I don't mind talking to him and mind helping him out, but there hasn't been a heck of a lot I can do, and, and it's been kind of frustrating. Do you think there is any way to help him? I don't know. I think there's been people that have loved him through the years, and at different times people have come into his life and tried to collaborate with him or tried to help him realize his vision artistically. And thankfully there were people like that that weren't just looking for, you know, like trying to get another big hit record. They realized that he was a true artist. Please join us in a warm welcome for a rare experience to play with all the greats. I'm, I'm pleased and, and proud to have co-produced his last two albums. A good friend of mine, a treat from Larry. I'm grateful that we had those experiences, and I'm very grateful that we chose to stick it out. I wouldn't do it again, but I'm really glad that we didn't bail on it. No, we did our bit. And somewhere down the line, I mean, what, Van Gogh sold one painting when he was alive, you know? I believe somewhere down the line, Larry's artistry will be acknowledged as important. Fisher was always a force of nature. He is a force of nature. He's like a poet, he's a bard in like the best of ways, I think. You know, in another, if he grew up in Mongolia, he might have been considered a, a shaman. And everything that he is and does would be tolerated and everybody would put up with all his idiosyncrasies. months ago I was thought people were trying to hurt me kill me hurt me or whatever and I was sleeping in the bus benches and I told my aunt please help please help and Josephine saved me here I am at Josephine's she saved my life they're gonna what tonight they're doing it tonight they're doing what they're killing me tonight what are you talking about who's killing you tonight what do I do you have any suggestions at this point no Larry because there's nobody after you Oh, yeah? Larry. Anyways, I guess, I guess I'm dead. I could get run over by a car. Then a car run me over. It'd be better than this other death that I'm going to face. How do I do that? Where do I find a car? Larry, don't talk like that, please. I'm let a train run me over. Here comes a train now. No! At 3.30 at night, somebody knocks on my door. I go and open it, and it's Larry. He has um, kind of deteriorated uh, quite a bit since I had seen him before. I don't see him much because I don't drive. I've lived up here alone for 26 years and never learned to drive. So he calls me on the phone frequently from pay phones. I have his first album, which I kept because he was losing his albums. He was losing everything. I thought, well, I, at least I have it, you know, that first album. And uh, What did you think of that first album? Well, I told you that's what I thought, that he was very creative and very original. You certainly are musical. You certainly have a good voice. 
I was just talking to him today. I said, Larry, why don't you up here? with them? nothing to do. Why don't you write about Sometimes the it's sunrise. Why don't you write Sometimes about the sunset? It's sunset. So, so he tells me. That, I said, that's good, Larry. Let's, let's hear the okay. song, Larry. Let's hear it. OK. Larry? Sometimes it's sunrise. Sometimes it's sunset. What's the rest of it? That's well, it. that's all right. You maybe I want to know. I told him maybe write three or four words. That's, that's how I write my songs. Yeah. How, how Larry? Right on the spot. Sure, anytime. That's Any, the best just, way to write. Just, it. just come to you anytime. Just walk along. Come, come sometimes it's sunset. Sometimes it's sunrise. <laughs> I always, every time I would talk to him, I said, Larry, write music. I don't care if you get published or not. Just write songs that'll keep your mind going. You know. He doesn't want television. He won't read a uh, uh, Reader's Digest. He's got to keep his mind going. So the best thing, if he can't do that, is to write songs. Josephine, oh, Josephine, my Aunt Sophine, my Josephine. Josephine, oh, Josephine, oh, Josephine, my Aunt. Come here, sweetheart. You two took good care of everybody. If I'd have hired somebody, they couldn't have done better. Uh, you know, it's good for you to take care of somebody. Well, yeah, because yeah, so, you know what it's me. like then. Larry, I really appreciate it. I didn't yeah. have to worry about him. I didn't have to worry about him at all. Larry, do you like living up at the house? What, what, what? Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. I like living up at the house. But Larry, eventually you may have to, you may want to be with assistant living. But I'm yeah. not sending you away, Larry. You know that. I, the trouble is that it gets too complicated. For yes, you. we're just all looking at what's practical for everybody, including you. Larry, how do you feel about what Gigi and Josephine were just talking to you about? I feel all right. I just want to make sure that I. Water in the I get there without, you know, having problems down the hill. You know. So you're not afraid about moving out? I am afraid about moving out. You are. I know you are. But, Larry, I promised you that I would never send you away. I'm not... But I also told you that when they came, you know, that it would be different. I told you that. And you don't have an extra um, copy? No. Yeah. Okay. So everything's going to be all right? I hope. What did John, when you've got family what did John got say that he said everything is going to be all right. Larry, it will be. There's a you can't go wrong. Where you've got love. I can go and go tell my secrets to exactly. in my room. But our concern is for you now. That's right. Like you're concerned in about me. Right. Room. I am concerned about you. Yes. Mm -hmm. I am concerned. Yes. I am concerned about you. I want you to get well. I know you are, Larry. Right. Oh, my He's going to lay down. Oh, Larry, it doesn't hurt her. This side doesn't hurt In my room. He's cold. Larry, tell us. What's going on, Larry? In my room. In Uh, he's, he's cold. He's cold in his Oh, he's cold in his house. Okay, he's cold in his house. He needs some help. No, no, let's go. Yeah. He's cold in his house. No, 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 I don't want a bed. You can lie down right next to Josie. You can lie down here. You can lie down if you want to. He's afraid again. What? Go back up to the house? He's afraid of moving. He's afraid of moving. You know, G yeah. you should let me stay as long as I, until it takes me, you know. That's right. That's what we're saying. Uh, Larry, you're 
you're not going to be abandoned. Right. That's what we're saying, as long you as it takes. You remember that you are not being abandoned. The dog is better off than me, because he can go anywhere anybody wants to take. I guess I'm getting older now. I'm 59 years old now. What's the matter? How do you feel? He said that getting old is going to be hard on me. What? I can't be a musician singer anymore. I'm too old. I want to be a musician singer. I want to make everybody happy. People don't want to make me happy. Everybody wants me dead. You know when it came in, Josh, you They want me dead. D-E-A-D, dead. Don't you? What? You son of a bitches. You'll never get rid of this. You'll never get away with this. This is a murder. What's he saying? Don't you know what this is? This is goddamn murder, man. You're never going to get away with it. You're never going to get away with this, motherfucker. Can you let me know what he's saying? I can't hear it. Nothing, man. They're I'm just saying this. What is he saying? What is he saying? Who's bigger than the Beatles? Larry! Larry! Yes, Larry, that can tell me something too. got a camera loaded with film I'm gonna take a picture of you I've got a camera loaded with film I'm gonna take a picture of you I'll take one in color I'll take one in black and white I've got a camera loaded with film I'm gonna take a picture a picture of you Jesus loves me Jesus needs me Jesus help me Christ the Lord Jesus save me, Jesus heal me, Jesus help me, Christ the Lord, Jesus wants me. <laughs> Go to Rhino Rex.
Records on Westwood Boulevard. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. They've got nice people there. They'll show you where the records are. Where are the records? They're over there. They're all over the place. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. Go to Rhino Records on Westwood Boulevard. Do, 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 do. Come on. <laughs> Do you ever have a go in life? You must have a go in life. If your go in life is to be a singer, then be a singer. If your go in life is to sleep on windows, it's your go, it's your go. Whatever what your go in life is, that's what you should do. It doesn't matter what you do, so long as you have a go in life. A go in life. My go in life was to be a singer, but it didn't come true. I think, I don't know, who cares, bye bye. When you've got as much talent as me, everybody will be afraid of you. They won't want to run away from you because they want to be as talented as you.